And that's the Darwin Oak um, in Shrewsbury. And um, that is currently threatened to be cut down for a bypass. So that is a tragic example that these trees don't have the legal protection that they need and that they deserve. And aside from that, I suppose just highlighting the age and the size of these beasts, um, does it just draw the public in, make them appreciate them a bit more? Yes, I think so. And I think probably we do take them a little bit for granted because you can find these um, fairly readily in the countryside. Um, but they are so important. I mean, as well as being visually iconic, they're like small nature reserves in their own right with their with their dead wood and their rocked holes and their cracks and their crevices. Um, they'll, they'll be playing host to fungi, to mosses, lichens, bats, birds, um, wood boring insects. So they're incredibly important for wildlife i mean if you ever wondered why we put bird boxes up and actually because that's because there aren't enough natural rot holes there aren't enough of these ancient trees and there aren't enough rot holes for um birds to go around to nest in so you know we're having to supplement our, our lack of uh, our, our lack of these trees by uh, by putting up bird boxes for example kate it's been so lovely to hear from you this morning thank you for joining us to give a rundown of the runners and riders of the the favorite tree of the tree of the year in the uk dr kate luthwaite there from the trust if you want to see the Scottish trees, they're on our news website. There's a story about them and the Skippenish oak is absolutely fabulous because it, it looks like it's got two outstretched arms. It really is quite And it is something. buried deep in a, in a forest so yeah, it's had absolutely. to work pretty hard over yes, the years. Yes, and you can see that. that yeah. uh, here's Sandy, he says I lived in New Zealand near the motorway in Auckland there's a hill with a tree on top. It's called One Tree Hill. But he's now he's in Dunkeld in Perthshire. Many distinguished trees, he says. Some with a massive girth, others with a distinctive shape. But the winner is the Douglas fir at the Hermitage. He says it's a lovely walk. Mm. It's reputed to be the tallest tree in Britain. I didn't know that. And Mark's been in touch. He says my favourite tree is the one burning on an open fire in a dimly lit room in complete quiet. I don't think that's in the spirit of this particular contest. No, Mark. indeed. But I do. It's a nice picture. And there's something about the crackle of wood when it starts to burn as well. But that's a whole other story. But we're not talking about that this morning. We're talking about the living trees. 80295 is our text number. Which is your favourite? Hashtag BBC GMS on social media. Now it's time for Thought for the Day. This morning it comes from the Reverend Jane Howitt. Good morning to you, Jane. Good morning. It won't have escaped your notice that news coverage these days often focuses on tragedy and suffering. So it was a welcome relief this week to discover a story that, although beginning in a dark place, ended with inspiration and hope. The Linda Norgrove Foundation, which is based up on the Isle of Lewis, has its roots in the tragic death of aid worker Linda herself in Afghanistan in 2010. It seeks to inspire women and girls through education and in so doing to transform their lives. And now the charity has brought 19 Afghan women to Scotland to complete medical studies denied to them in their home country simply because of their gender. A personal tragedy and some might say a national tragedy, a generation of women denied the opportunity to reach their full potential and both become the basis for significant transformation, bringing hope and purpose far beyond the individuals involved. It reminds me of a line from a song that we sing in church that speaks of Jesus turning tragedy to triumph. The death of Jesus looked like a terrible tragedy, and yet the resurrection followed and was an incredible triumph of life over death. In so many ways, that's what Jesus is about, transforming tragedy into something life-giving and full of hope. Knowing that Jesus brings light into the darkest of situations, often transforming them beyond our expectations, brings blessing into our everyday challenges and allows space for hope and a fresh sense of purpose to develop. The experiences in our lives that begin in darkness often also have the potential to end in inspiration and in hope. We mustn't give up, but keep believing that our personal tragedies can, like those of these Afghan women, be turned into triumph, and especially so when we're willing to use our difficult experiences for the transformation of others. 
Jane, thank you very much indeed. 7.25. Phil's here with Sport. Day one of the Women's Open Championship at St Andrews, Phil. And Gary, a battle perhaps ahead this morning with the weather. 40 mile an hour gusts with rain forecast across the old course. Thankfully play underway despite that forecast. Uh, keeping an eye on it all as she's done. Over the last five decades is golf writer Louine Mayer. Louine, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thankfully we're underway at the old course. Well, that's excellent, and I wonder how, for how long, because yeah. um, I fear there'll be delays. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, <laughs> Katrina Matthews, out just after half past seven, uh, Louine, somebody that you will have uh, reported extensively on across her career. She's announced that this will be her last Open Championship. Um, a word on her this morning and what she's done, not just for the game, but also for, for women's sport in this country. Oh, Katrina has been terrific. I mean, she. Um, I used to watch her when she was a junior, and then she. I mean, she was quite brave turning pro when she did, because it was still not. You know, you didn't know whether to do it or not. Now they all want to do it, but Katrina was just absolutely terrific, and she married the right guy because he was right behind her, and they've had children. They've got two children, and she. I think because she's got the children as well as the golf, it's been a, a great blend. I think it takes that. You know, they they're not golfing geeks, <laughs> as um, Lydia Ko was saying. You know, I'm not a golfing geek, but you know, you get these ones who think of nothing but the golf, and I don't think it does them an awful lot of good. Famously, of course, winning the uh, Open back in 2009, just 11 weeks. After uh, after giving birth, um, Louine, I mentioned that you've been over fifty years a golf writer. You're the UK's first female golf correspondent. Uh, that at the uh, at the Telegraph. Um, the changes you've seen in the women's game in that time, I guess the term "vast" doesn't do it justice. No, it's been amazing. I mean, you know, I do remember a certain club where I was invited to come and write about the bunkers. And um, it was very nice, but it was a slightly snowy day and I'd gone along and um, I was offered a very nice looking um, seat and the cushion was made of snow and it was outside. And I had to wait for the greenkeeper to come to show me the, the bunkers. You know, I wasn't taken inside the clubhouse. <laughs> because you couldn't? Because you couldn't, yeah. yes. Um, the very fact that the Open is, is back again at St Andrews for the for the third time and nobody's blinking an eye just shows how much golf in the women's game has moved on oh absolutely i mean originally you know when the it was in 2007 the first one at um st andrews the first women's open and that was when lovely girl lorena ochoa won but i do remember a scottish girl Janice Moody. Yes. She, and the, the, she, uh, you'll remember that name. Now she was, she played, uh, you know, she was a friend of um, Katrina's and they, they played a lot together then. And I do remember she had a baby and they were using the men's cloakrooms at St. Andrews. The men have very kindly lent them to the women because it was definitely an all male place at that time. And there was Janice Moody um, changing her baby's nappy in the men's lock room. I think that must have given a lot of the men a terrible fright. Uh, the very fact that we are we are looking back into what almost sounds the dark ages, yet it was only uh, only 17 years ago, and um, with a story like that, as I say, just probably shows how much how much the, the game has moved on. Um, as far as this week's concerned, Louine, quickly at St Andrews, can Lillian Vu defend her title that she won so uh, impressively 12 months ago? I think she can. She's a, a very fine golfer and a very fine person as well. Um, I was speaking to her at the Scottish Open last week and, OK, she hadn't played that well there, but she is a great player and she's um, the, the tougher the course, the better she is. So I think it could be very interesting watching her. Louine Mayer, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, this morning. Louine Mayer there, uh, recognised as golf's first female correspondent over 50 years writing about the sport. She's at St Andrews for day one of the Women's Open. Uh, Miyu Yamashita, the early leader on one under par. Eye on the weather, though, with, with the forecast the RNA tell us. Um, not too great for, uh, for play this morning. A little later, we'll focus uh, not just on St Andrews, but also the football this evening as Kilmarnock and Hearts go for, uh, go for the uh, chance to make it through to the uh, European League propers this season. We'll bring you a full weather forecast in the next five minutes. And we'll talk more about how tourist tax operates around the world. It is half past seven.
on digital radio, FM, your smart speaker, and on BBC Sounds, BBC Radio Scotland. Time for this morning's news and sport for the borders with Angela Suave. Good morning. Health bosses will today look back on their performance over the past year. The NHS Borders Annual Review is being held at the Borders General Hospital Chaplaincy Centre. It also allows members of the public to raise their own issues with senior staff. There have been success stories during 2023-24, such as cancer and addiction waiting times, but there are still problem areas such as A&D and mental health, and they'll also be addressed. Today's annual review starts at 2.30. Road safety improvements have been made at East Gordon near Erlston where an 11-year-old schoolgirl was struck by a bin lorry in January. Elizabeth Bell had been on her way to get a school bus. She died in hospital a week after the accident. Her death led to a campaign by locals for road safety improvements on the A6105. The council's now improved signage and renewed road markings as well as introducing a pavement on the either side of the road. A Selkirk woman has admitted giving children a controlled drug at the town's sheriff court. David Knox reports. 42-year-old Jennifer Sherlaw pleaded guilty to giving two young girls a diazepam pill at her home in Halliday's Park on December the 1st last year. Prosecutor Drew Long said the accused was under the influence at the time and offered the girls the pill. Although they did not digest the tablet, the offer caused them enough concern to report it to the police. She admitted the offence under the Children and Young People's Act. The Sherlaw claimed the girls had begged her to get them some cannabis and instead gave them the pill to split between them. Sheriff Peter Patterson said it was a serious matter and he deferred sentence until October the 28th when she had other matters calling. Borders SNP MSP Christine Graham says there can be no excuses for Scottish Borders Council not spending half of its annual affordable housing allocation. As we revealed last week, the local authority returned £8 million out of the £16 million provided for 2023-24 because they said of delays with planning and contract tendering. With a housing emergency declared by both the council and the Scottish Government, Ms Graham doesn't accept the excuse of slippage for the loss of funding. Slippage, what an interesting word when you've just handed back eight million. Um they are the planning authority. The council's the planning authority. And it's open now even to councils, even though they have housing associations, they can start building council houses if they want. So we could find ways of accelerating as they would be building them for the council mm. and they are the planning authority, then they could accelerate the process and have projects in hand ready for the money to come. They know money's coming every year. We'll get ready for it. A special memorial rugby match is being held in Kelso on Sunday to remember player and coach Ailey Walker. She collapsed and died from sudden arrhythmic death syndrome aged just 31 after a coaching session in May. One of the Kelso players, now assistant coach Donna Borthwick, was Ailey's partner. The couple were due to be married last weekend. Donna believes the annual match between Kelso and Gala with a social event open to all will provide a fitting legacy for Ailey a person passionate about supporting girls and women in sport. I think that the ladies just totally took her in and they really respected her because she was an ex-player as well, which makes a big difference. She's super knowledgeable. Like, she would read everything. We've got hundreds of books about rugby, hundreds of coaching books, and she would sit probably six nights out of seven planning the sessions for the girls and for the ladies as well. So... Ailey had time for absolutely every single person on our team and at the club too. She just made sure that everybody was involved at all times and she really listened to people like if there was something wrong, she would always message them. She wasn't just a coach, she was everybody's best friend. Staying with rugby, the Kings of the Sevens has now paused until April after round two is completed on Saturday at Gala. Eight more tournaments are planned in the spring, played in the spring, sorry, culminating in the Melrose Sevens with their new date at the end of May. But some are unhappy with the format. Gala director of rugby, Ewan Swinton, believes the competition should be played in one block, even if some events have to go. Should it comprise ten? Should it comprise seven? Uh, That will be seen as a very threatening comment by some, but uh, I think there are workarounds that could make that happen. And we need to find a way to rationalise it uh, into a a single tournament. There may be some culling required to to bring that to to pass, and that will be a hugely unpopular comment in some uh, quarters, and I would completely understand that. 
In football, Linton Hotspur's game against Faldhouse United last night in the East of Scotland Third Division was called off because of a waterlogged pitch. And in racing, Jedburgh trainer Gary Rutherford saddled his first winner on the flat at Carlisle yesterday. Rebecca's girl won the seven for long maiden handicap. And at York, Jason Hart, uh, the white jockey rode Jim Jungle to a 10 to 1 win in the £61,000 sprint. The Borders weather now, here's Callum McCall. A wet and windy start to the morning with a Met Office high wind warning in force till 9am. However, conditions will improve from the west by mid to late morning as the remnants of Ernesto clear into the North Sea, becoming brighter with sunny spells but still a blustery westerly wind and feeling cool. Tonight we will see another area of low pressure move in with another spell of heavy rain. This will clear through tomorrow morning to brighter skies, but also a few showers. BBC Radio Scotland's weather for the borders. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And on BBC Sounds. BBC Radio Scotland. And this is Good Morning Scotland with Gary and Laura. Thank you for being with us this morning. Let's get more now on the proposed visitor levy for Edinburgh, which would see tourists paying a 5% surcharge on hotels and B&Bs. Councillors will consider the proposals later. Critics say it would put people off coming to the capital. Those in favour believe it would raise millions of pounds a year to spend on areas including housing and public spaces. Well, John Lennon is director of the Moffat Centre for Travel and Tourism Business Development at Glasgow Caledonian University. Morning to you, John. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. 5% sounds like quite a lot on the face of it. How does that compare with what's happening elsewhere around the world? Well, um, yeah, visitor levies are not new. They are uh, evident in many parts of the UK, including, of course, in England, where both Manchester and Liverpool have been operating uh, a one pound per room levy under a walk around, not actually a visitor levy, but as part of their bid. Um, I think you also see visitor levies in cities from New York to Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Paris, Rome. New York, for example, it's 15% on rooms, so 5% in Edinburgh looks quite small by comparison. I think for the businesses, for the, the accommodation operators, uh, it, it's for them, they see it as yet another tax and they feel they already pay taxes. They pay corporation tax on their profits. They pay tax on employees and proprietor earning. And of course, they pay VAT. Uh, and this transient visitor levy at 5%, they would have to collect from July 26. Now, I think that is uh, the reality of it. Now, will that actually put visitors off? It would seem that New York, Amsterdam, Barcelona has not seen significant diminution in visitors because of minor percentage movements in the levy. Um, at the extreme example, I suppose Venice introducing its five euro levy uh, this year, uh, there was very little impact in terms of overall tourist numbers. So it's price is obviously a factor here in whether or not it dissuades people. Is it a bit of a sweet spot though? Sorry, on you go. Yeah, I just wonder if there's a bit of a sweet spot because five euros to get into Venice, there'd be a lot of people who say, well, actually, I'd, I'd rather it was a bit higher to try and reduce the numbers further. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're really trying, if you're trying to go to the fringe and, and stay cheaply, it's virtually impossible to do that in Edinburgh now. Uh, and so the extra five percent just might be the difference between going not not traveling there uh, yeah yeah it, it looks though when we're seeing uh, percentage levies of equivalent cities where in edinburgh you've got you know significant demand there i think 5.3 million uh, room nights per year that it's going to be marginal in terms of price disruption. If you think about if your EasyJet or your Ryanair flight went up by 5% or 10%, or indeed more recently when it's jumping by a quarter, 25%, that's not significantly put off outbound international travel. So you're at a threshold there where it's quite low, 5%, but 